Welcome back to Secondhand Overland. I'm your host, Matt Kester. If this is your first time here, well, let me introduce you to my Land Rover Discovery One. If you're not new here, let me reintroduce you to my Land Rover Discovery One. Now I say my Land Rover Discovery One because I just got it for a song from a lady who bought it two years ago and her soon-to-be ex, long-haired hippie stoner husband spent the last two years going through this thing and fleshing it out, getting all of the major mechanical issues taken care of, and well, it's a hell of a vehicle and it's ready to go on damn near any adventure you want to throw at it. All jokes aside, yes, this is now my vehicle moving and going forward, and uh, well, I'm ready to give you an update and share with you everything that I've had to do with it over the last few months and years and where we're at with it and what I think the future might hold for this vehicle. This is a 1998 Land Rover Discovery 1. It is the last full production year of the first generation Discovery, which is the parts Ben Beauty that shares most of its underpinnings with the Range Rover Classic and the Defender. This particular model has the Rover V8 in it, uh, the GEMS edition, which features solid state engine management and and a distributorless ignition, all a great option. And oh yeah, OBD2, which is another thing I love. It sits in that sweet spot of vehicles between 1996 and 2006 that have solid state engine management, OBD2, but not the electronics and technology bloat that came later that screwed up everything. Now it does have about 130,000 miles on the clock. And in the two years since it's been in my care, we have done everything from changed the head gaskets, replaced the radiators, replaced the shocks and springs all the way around, replaced all of the ball joints and end links, replaced the A-frame ball joint, fixed the step. Let's just go through it and we'll talk about it right now. All right, ready, ready, let's go. <sighs> yeah, I gotta use those because the hood spring is broken. I'll have to fix that later. <clears throat> okay. So as you can see, under the hood, we have the GEMS 4.0 liter Land Rover V8. And this is a derivative of the fabled Buick 215 all aluminum V8 that has been the heart of almost every British V8 powered sports car or heavy vehicle from essentially the 1960s to the early 2000s. In fact, I, I believe the TVR has even had a version of this in it. So it's an engine that's had a wide ranging application, but it does have its wide range of issues. And one of those is head gaskets. And it's something that we have since replaced. Uh, some other things under here that have been done. Well, the radiator. This is actually the second radiator I put in it. The first one I tried was one of the Nissan's plastic radiators and sure enough these plastic sides of it ended up stripping out and I was leaking coolant and everything else everywhere within no time so I bit the bullet and bought a $800 radiator from Atlantic British and had it damn near overnighted so I could get it in time for a Baja trip. Uh, and put it in and have not had any issues since which is one of those things I've slowly learned with this vehicle is that you don't want to buy cheap parts buy good parts not the most expensive parts but buy good parts uh, otherwise you're just going to be replacing them down the road and that radiator taught me a valuable lesson some other things we've done under here I've replaced a steering box uh, the original steering box was leaking. I replaced all of the hoses and lines that I could. Uh, just recently, we started having a cooling issue, and I essentially went through and replaced the thermostat, water pump, and the clutch fan, and finally got it under control. It actually turned out to be the water pump, which is, um, again, cheap parts thing. I bought a cheap water pump when I did the head gaskets and replaced that, and of course that within two years was not pumping a sufficient volume of fluid through the engine and cause it to overheat. Coming up next that I'm gonna have to tackle inside of here, uh, we gotta do a brake master cylinder. Not a big problem, it's just a pain in the ass to bleed brakes down after you do it. Beyond that, up here, I've replaced all of the end links. Had to replace a track rod because it was frozen shut when I went in to get it aligned. Uh, that's really about it up here in the engine compartment. When it comes to tires, we're running the Falcon Wild Peak AT3s and a 245-75 R16. Uh, this vehicle originally came with a pair of 265-75 R16s on it that turned out to be just a bit too much. 
at least ripped out the rear fenders and they were just a lot more than this 180 horse V8 wanted to turn pushing this 6,000 pound behemoth down the highway. We've gone down to this size. It has improved on highway road manners, uh, perceived power. The transmission doesn't hunt and pack for gears as much as it used to. And well, these tires here are a lot cheaper if I have to buy new ones somewhere. Since we've switched, I've noticed no discernible difference in its off-road capabilities. I'm very, 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 very much sold on the Wild Peak AT3 as a great all-around AT tire, and I will continue to put them on vehicles. Uh, they just have held up really well. They've gone through a series of conditions. I, I pretty much ran these in everything but mud. We just don't get a lot of mud where I live in the areas that I go to, but as far as rocks, sand, gravel, uh, these have been really, really good. Now, wheels, I'm sticking with the aluminums. Um, maybe one day I would convert these to steelies, but beyond that, I'm not a big rims and tires guy. It doesn't really matter to me. Rims are all look for me, unless you are actually buying something like a beadlock or a really, really, really super light wheel. Now, under here, suspension-wise, we're running terra firma with a uh, light plus two spring in here with the terra firma shocks. And out back, we run the terra firma big bores stepped up to a medium spring rate or a medium load plus two spring in the back to kind of carry all of the camping gear a little bit easier. Same thing uh, in the front shocks. Uh, at a certain point, we may put the big bores in there like the back because I've been very, very, very happy with those big bores. But right now, I just don't need to. I'm not breaking shocks. I'm not having a problem with these blowing out. So we're gonna stick with what we got up there. Uh, and as far as a heavy duty front bumper, well, I don't need a winch and I've never scraped this bumper on anything, so why get rid of it? It's working just fine. Speaking of the big bores, well, here they are behind me in all their glory. Now, these things came recommended to me by our good friend Andy Wilson over in the UK, and well, Andy, I can't say thank you enough. Uh, these things have been awesome, and when we come time to replace the front shocks, uh, they'll be getting replaced with the big bores. They're just built so incredibly durable and strong. You can you can see the quality and the full penetration welds in the shanks on them. Like, I have full confidence that these things aren't going to break on me out in the field, and that makes me feel good. Okay. Cockpit and control station, whatever. Basically, uh, it's very minimal. And I've done that on purpose, and that's also because I don't have any money to buy nice shit. But uh, navigation, well, that's done right here on an iPhone, right there in a cheap iOdi cradle. Uh, there's no RAM mounts in here. There's nothing that fancy. I don't have an iPad for navigation. I just have my iPhone, and I load it with Gaia Maps, which apparently Gaia just launched a new overlanding map that I'm actually kind of excited about because there were some, well, some significant drawbacks they were facing as compared to their competition, but I'm digressing. Beyond that, uh, let's see. Well, we have obviously got our ultra gauge here so that we can keep track of the engine temperature since Land Rover Discoveries are notoriously uh, inaccurate with their temperature reading on the dashboard. By the time that needle moves up, well, it's too damn late and you've already blown your engine up. Um, well, the cruise control still doesn't work because I haven't gone and fished out the back lines. Uh, we updated the old, well, it, we didn't update it, it didn't work. We put in a cheap Sony head unit. I think I may be upgrading that to something else at a different point in time, but uh, added the factory Land Rover cup holders. Did it a little different though. I don't like things over here by my knee, so I put them both on this side. The seats in the original version of this were just completely ripped and shredded. We've since added these Cover King seat covers. You can get these through Costco, usually at a significant discount off the Costco website. Uh, or you can order them direct from Cover King. I'll put a link in the description below to them. Communications, well, I've got my cell phone. I've also got a Ocean KG-1000G GMRS mobile right here, 50 water. But I probably will be upgrading that in the future because I've now got my technician ham license. I'm not limited to just talking on GMRS, and I will probably be upgrading that with some form of a dual band radio very soon. Now, for those of you who have been watching the channel for any length of time, this is where things are gonna start getting different from the last time you saw it. The last time you saw this rig, I had taken these seats out and I was planning on getting rid of this and 
building this out into some sort of internal sleeper or massive storage. Well, I'm getting rid of the Forerunner. So this is going to be, um, well, my only vehicle for a little while. And as such, I gotta really think through the realm of practicality. So I'm gonna put the seats back in. Also, I'm not gonna be taking long expedition grade trips for a little while. So I don't really need to have a platform sleeper built in here, but what I might need, I might need to haul my kid plus one of his friends somewhere for something, or if my parents come into town or whatever. So um, the future of this build is gonna incorporate the full row. I've got the 40% seat over here in the garage, we'll be putting it back in. But for right now, I've just kind of got some spare parts stacked up and my tools and a 100 watt solar panel and a pop-up shower. And when I get back home, we'll organize all that out. I, I'm really going to make this thing to where a lot of the stuff that comes in or out uh, every trip fairly easy and, um, well, still able to use this as a grocery getter if I need to. Oh, I'm going to get seat covers for these seats because they're pretty nasty. Now, out back, well, we've got two trasheroo style bags or two spare tire carrier bags uh, first one i just got all of the basic recovery gear in there i decided instead of keeping all this stuff on the inside where it would get dirty or whatever we just put it in this bag it hangs nice and neat off of the factory ladder back here and, and then on the other side we have our secondhand overland branded trash bag it's actually an all stop but whatever it doesn't matter anyway uh if you're ever interested in buying one of these let me know uh, I think I might have a way to get them. They're not going to be any cheaper than anything else out there, but it would be a great way to support the channel. If you're interested, let me know in the comments below. I'll, uh, I'll make a link on the website for them if there's enough people that are interested in it. This bumper did get damaged the last time we went off-roading with our buddy Todd almost a year ago, and the side pods are gone. At some point in time, I probably will replace it with a heavy-duty steel bumper, but for right now, I'm just going to run it. It doesn't matter. <coughs> Now this is where the magic happens, of course, the galley. Now this is about as basic white bitch as it gets. We have plywood laid across unistrut and two by fours stacked up on the bottom. You saw them in a, in a previous video. Well, I put that back in there just the way it was. It's held down with ratchet straps. It hasn't gone anywhere. It makes a very nice shelf. Below the shelf, I'm able to put, well, all of the kitchen things in little baskets down here and get to them when I need them. Pots, pans butane fuel, the shovel, those sorts of things. And then across the top, of course, we have our set power fridge, my butane stove, which we used to have a two burner propane that got stolen from us a long time ago. We replaced it with this single burner canister butane stove. And I've loved this. This is uh, a $30 stove versus a hundred or 120 for the one that got stolen. And it works like a champ. These butane fuel canisters are so much easier and cheaper to deal with than the one pound propane bottles. I, I don't feel as guilty throwing these away. And I don't want you to come right back and talk about refilling propane canisters because, well, that's not what they were designed for. It's not the safest thing to do with them. So I'm not gonna recommend people do that. But um, these butane stoves are awesome. Like I said, the cylinders are cheaper and you're not dealing with the propane cylinders. Now you could get a bulk propane bottle, but then you're hanging it somewhere on the vehicle. And I don't need that. Honestly, we're not going on as many trips as we used to or as far as we used to. The other thing, I only eat once a day because since I lost the 100 pounds, I've been doing intermittent fasting and I literally have one to two meals a day. And the biggest meal that we would ever cook out here would either be breakfast or dinner. And well, it's kind of hard when you don't eat a lot to then get up and want to make a big meal for just yourself or just yourself and your kid. Cause you don't have a wife to go overlanding with anymore. All right, moving on. Um, basic Stereolite three drawer plastic shelving. You can get it from Walmart. This is like 10 bucks. I bought this two or three years ago. It has worked ever since. It used to be in the Forerunner. It is now in here. And then you got a Rhino pack. Uh, this is actually their Aquatainer. It's perfect. You pull it out, you pull it down, you got a spout. Uh, and then to the side of that, we also have the Rinse Kit Pro, which uh, surprisingly enough, 
I used that rinse kit pro a lot more than I thought I was going to. In fact, I probably sold it short in the review that I originally made for it. And it's not from the aspect of using it as a shower as much as using it to wash dishes, wash your hands, just to have access to pressurized water really quick. It's been amazing for those things. And uh, as far as showering, well, I've just gotten to the point where we don't shower every day we go out. I can go a whole weekend without having a shower. Uh, on a longer trip, it's nice to have, and of course it's here. The other th great thing about this thing has been its battery life. I've recharged it twice since I've owned it, and I've never had it go dead on me in the field. I've just recharged it to recharge it. It's a very good product. It has lasted. If you want to check one out, go ahead and click the link in the description below. It's been a great product, and honestly, after having had it, if I had the money to buy it with my own money, I would, and I wouldn't hesitate. Now, rounding the rest of this out is uh, my one nice piece here, and that's, well, it's my door, or my tabletop. And this was just a quick, easy afterthought on how to build a table for this. Now I took these nice cam lock hooks, put paracord into it, and the tabletop itself is actually just a bench, workbench, uh, toolbox top that we saw at Home Depot that was like 20 bucks and some hinges. This is literally probably the cheapest piece of wood I could have bought to go back here, and it's a very nice piece of glued together hardwood. So there you go, there's your cooking station. And the other thing I like about it is the way that we've designed it. If, if if you break something back here, every piece of this is replaceable at a Home Depot. That's where I got the hinges, that's where I got the top, that's where I got these hooks. And because the stays are just 5150 paracord, well, like any, like any good outdoors person, you should be carrying this with you anyway. So you've got a means to replace that if it ever frays or breaks. Now let's talk about the future. I don't know. I don't know what the future holds for this. I would like to think that at some point in time I would build this into a sleeper, but here's the problem. Um, I don't want to get a rooftop tent. This vehicle doesn't react well to rooftop tents. I can't afford a nice wedge tent to put up here, so I'm not going to go buy a hard shell tent for three or $4,000 to put on here. Um, we've tried a bag tent up here, a clamshell style tent, and it didn't work that great. It's just too high off the ground. It up the center of gravity. So the next option would be to build some kind of sleeper. Well, a Discovery One is significantly shorter. It's a 100 inch wheelbase. And the back end to the back of the seats is actually shorter than I am taller. So the only way to make an effective sleeper here would be to have to make it so that one of the front seats slid all the way forward. This has power front seats. I don't want to be in a situation where I've woken up in the morning and then have to go find a horse jockey to drive my Discovery somewhere because the seat is too far forward for me to get in between the seat and the steering wheel. So um, the Camp Right tent was a good option for a long time, uh, however it had some issues with breakage and um, also the fact that um, I'd be sleeping single in a double bed if you want to quote Barbara Mandrell. Right now it's just me and the boy in backpacking gear. And that's gonna work for us, and it's gonna suffice for us for quite a while. Uh, and it also gets the weight load down and the cost down on this thing. Uh, beyond that, as far as like off-road mods, well, I don't need any. This thing has taken me everywhere I've ever wanted to go, and never, ever, ever have I failed to get to a spot I wanted to go. Sometimes there were some challenges. Sometimes I pushed it further than I should have. But again, I've never pointed this in the direction of a thing and not been able to get there. And that just speaks to how well thought out and how well of a vehicle or how good of a vehicle Land Rover built all those years ago with this long travel coil suspension, the solid front and rear axles, and that center locking diff. Like people say, maybe you should get lockers in it. Well, I've never got in a situation where I needed lockers, so I'm not gonna spend the thousands of dollars to put them in here. Realistically, I don't know if there's much more that's gonna be built into here for a while. Um, until maybe I start going more and more and more. But for right now, I'm perfectly content just making this more of a, well, what I envision overlanding ass, and that's, automotive backpacking. And the more I've learned over the last few years about what you really do and don't need, 
I've learned that I don't need as much as I thought I did. Like when we started out with that forerunner and a rooftop tent, and next thing you know, we had a shower and a full galley and everything but a fridge. And those things were all nice, but after a while, you just didn't use all of them all the time. So I don't think I'm gonna invest that much into it because I would like to put my money towards other things like fuel or permits to go places or uh, getting into other things and that's uh, another point of where we're probably going to go with this channel and what you're going to see moving forward is that I don't know if overlanding in the world of five dollar a gallon gasoline is going to be sustainable forever so I do love the outdoors so I've got to find other ways that are more approachable more practical more easier for people to get into and that's where this channel is gonna start taking some other directions. You're gonna see more backpacking content. You're going to see more of the radios because, well, they pay the bills and I find them interesting. And you're also gonna see some other outdoors activities start popping up here. And I think that's all well and good because we've gotta just get out of this mold of these heavy ass four wheel drive vehicles going and rock crawling with rooftop tents because that's not going to be sustainable in the future that we're looking at. Um, am I still going to keep this and go on trips? Well, yes, absolutely. But I also think that I've got to be conscious about where we're spending and applying our resources uh, for trips. I'm not just going to take this out for trip's sake because it's $100 every time I fill this tank. Till next time, I'm Matt Kester. You can find us on Facebook and the Instagram at Secondhand Overland. Be good.